Hello, my name is Tim Smith, and I'm one of the members here at Desert Grace Church. We have a great message for you today. If you enjoy this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and leave a comment so we know that you've been blessed. God bless. All right. We took a little bit of time off from uh, the life or the reign of King David, but we're back now. Um, aren't you excited? You probably already know this, but somebody who allows or, or lets somebody that they love sort of engage in negative or self-destruct behavior, um, they call that enabling. That would make you an enabler. Um, this term has been kind of popularly thrown around and, and kind of made all over the place and and I don't know whether I think that uh, everything that we do is enabling or everything we do isn't. But one of the things that I have learned is that essentially when there is something that you should say to somebody you love about maybe an addiction that they have or a behavior that they have or whatever else, and you stay silent, you're allowing that bad behavior to continue. And that's something we have to be really careful about. Or, alternatively, if you're not doing something that needs to be done for that person, you're kind of in the same exact boat. Psychologists would tell you that enabling is often a result of sort of a misguided compassion. That essentially what it comes from is us saying we really care and we really love somebody. And so instead of doing the difficult thing, what we end up doing is the easy thing, which is either to stay silent or to do nothing. You see, it could be that we really deeply care about what is going on in that person's life and that we really want things to change, but we're not really sure what to do because I'm sure that you and I both know that we have been around people who occasionally have needed to hear something, but we don't want to offend or hurt or ruin a relationship. So out of our compassion, we end up doing nothing, which then allows the bad behavior to continue and possibly even spiral out of control. My question for us this morning is what should David's guiding principles have been as it relates to others' immoral acts? Now, we can talk about David's own immoral acts. In fact, there's a sermon a few back that you would hear about that. But David is kind of uh, an enabler, in a sense, to other people when they do immoral acts. And what should he really have been doing? What should really have been the focus of what he was trying to do? So, in case you're not really familiar with David, you should know that his life was absolutely characterized by a very strong faith. And he has several amazing stories about how he lived out that faith. In fact, one of the things that made David the most upset is when other people would make fun of or disrespect Yahweh, his God. That's something that we probably need to be a little more aggressive about in our day and age, but that's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. But the reality is that if you want to talk about David and Goliath, look at what leads up to it. Goliath is out there basically saying that Yahweh has no power. And David is telling his fellow Israelites, why are you just standing around? We can take care of this problem easy. All you need is a slingshot and a stone. And he went out and he proved it. And we could go on and on about the amazing things that David did all the way up until the point in which he becomes king. We don't get to see a lot of what he does as king because almost immediately after he's become king, the story begins to sort of change a little bit. And we see David where he used to go out with the troops and be part of the war, be a part of everything that was going on. 
And, and that's where a king belongs, leading his troops, to now he's hanging out, taking a nap in the afternoon of his house, gets up to take a little walk, looks over the, uh, the edge of his balcony, and sees that wonderful Bathsheba woman down there and decides he must have her, what I'm calling the Bathsheba incident. Don't have time to go in all that. If you've been around the church very long, you know what happens next. Since then, we have Amnon attacking his half-sister, sexually speaking. We have Absalom getting absolutely upset about that, taking in his sister, and then also plotting to kill Amnon and waiting a couple of years and then carrying it out. Absalom then flees the country, and when we last left 2 Samuel, that's where we had left Absalom. He was away in Geshur, which is the fam- his mother's side family, and that's where he was. Now, we find out that <clears throat> David, actually, it says that he kind of mourned Amnon, and then he comes back to uh, essentially kind of missing or longing for, is what it says, Absalom. But he does nothing about it. In fact, it's Joab who steps in to become a mediator, and he wants Absalom to be able to return from his exile, from being banished, and he does so by beginning on the right foot, which always is when you want to get something done and you want to be a mediator, lie. (laughs) Actually, that always gets you off on the wrong foot, but hey, that's what Joab chooses to do, and he launches a plan of deceit. If you know the story, you may know that he finds what they call a wise woman from the area of Tekoa. It's probably about 10 miles from Jerusalem. And he finds this woman to basically play act a role and get an audience before the king. So they say that she's a wise woman, but actually most of what she says is what David t- or what Joab tells her to say. She gets an audience with the king because in those days you go get an audience with the king and he will judge what's right or what's wrong or how something should take care of. So Joab has set this whole thing up. He says to the woman whose name we don't even know, dress like you're mourning. Dress like you have been mourning for a long time, for several days. Don't put on any perfumes. Don't get showered up. Don't put on any makeup. You know, look like you are really sad and mourning and go to the king so that you can tell him this elaborate story. When you get there, begin by identifying yourself as a widow. That means that your husband is out of the picture and it means that your sons would now be responsible for taking care of you and that's for the rest of your life. That without them, there's no one to care for you and and do what you're supposed to do. Joab tells her, tell David that she has two sons. The two sons went out into a field. They were by themselves. They got into some sort of fight. While they were out there, one of their sons, one of her sons, killed the other sons. Now, does this story sound familiar to anybody? Right? Thinking of Cain and Abel, everyone's favorite joke. Just how long did Cain hate his brother? As long as he was able. No extra tithe needed for that one. He says to her, tell David, or let the king know that the community wants to take out the other son, that they're clamoring for the other son's death, so bring the other son in so that they would be in accordance with the law. So now she would be absolutely devastated. There would be nobody to take care of her. There'd be nobody to to carry on the family name. What on earth would she do next? David hears this story from the Tekoa woman and doesn't realize that essentially, while there are some differences, she is giving his story. 
Now, obviously, he's not a widow, and they weren't out into a field specifically, but her whole thing is, look, he's out there. There are, there, there's Amnon, and there's Absalom, and Absalom has Amnon killed, and there's nobody to protect him at the moment. And so it's sort of the same kind of thing. And, and what she's really trying to get at is that the king, sorry, I'm not keeping up here. The king needs to do something so that there will not be an issue. So she makes a case, will you completely pardon my son and my family, so that my husband's name, my husband's line will continue. And by the way, that also means there will be somebody to take care of me, right? The important things in life. Go ahead. David declares that the son should not be harmed. And when she starts to push him a little bit, he says, she says, I want an oath from you. And so she, he gives her the oath. That means that he says in front of God and everybody else, your son is not going to be harmed. And he's going to make sure that everything is the way it's supposed to be. And so now they can all live happily ever after, right? I mean, for one, this was a made-up story that Joab made up in his mind. But she says, basically, let me say a little more to you, king. In case you didn't know, you just indicted yourself. You, you basically convicted yourself. Because you're saying that my son should not be put to death for what he did, but should be allowed to continue to be with the family and not be banished. And your own son is out and banished, and you are not forgiving him and bringing him back the way you promised that my son would be. So now, this wonderful deceit, that's the best way to get everything started, right? Has turned out with David kind of being brought in to a trap. Because he ruled a certain way in that pretend case, that means that now he is pretty much obligated to bring Absalom back into Israel and kind of let him right back into the family, now, David is not stupid. In fact, he's pretty smart, and he starts to hear this story, sees what's going on, and he immediately notices this smells and sounds like Joab. And so he kind of confronts her and says, hey, did Joab put you up to this? And she says, yes. That's a kind of shortened version, but, you know, basically... Yes, I'm here because Joab sent me here. That's what I'm doing. She says something really interesting in chapter 14, verse 14. She says, now this is a little bit, sh little bit shortened from what she actually says, but God devises ways so that a banished person does not remain banished from him. Now, it's kind of an interesting thing to say, and I think she's kind of trying to, at one point, try to tell David, look, no matter what, Absalom was coming back because God wants him back. Whether that's true or not, we can go on a whole other story. But I think the second thing is, is that that's a truth for us. We should pay a little bit of attention to what she says. Even if she's just acting, even if Joab told her to say something like that, I think that God wants us to be able to be near him and not be banished. So David says, hey, fine, I'm going to give you what you want. So Joab is told, hey, go get my son Absalom, bring him back, but he is not to see me. So Joab is absolutely thrilled. He's so excited. He is just like, he's pumped. But David is not necessarily looking forward to Absalom's return. He's so not looking forward to it that he tells him, I don't even want to see him. Bring him back to Israel. Take him to his house. But don't bring him here. I don't want to see him. It's an interesting thing. 
In, in some respects, it's as though the king is granting Joab a personal favor. And we can talk about all kinds of theories that there are about why would Joab even get involved in this in the first place. It could have been very possible that Joab was sitting there going, you know what? David's starting to get older in age. He's starting to slip. People are not trusting him as much. And so it's time for there to be a new king. And maybe the, that David might have even been prepping his next son to be king. But, but Joab thinks if I can bring Absalom back, he would be the next in line because he would be the next oldest. And if I can get him on my side, then I'm guaranteed a job as we continue. That's a possibility, but we really don't know. The chapter kind of switches with, all right, now Absalom is back in Israel. He's back in his house, and all of a sudden you have this weird thing. <clears throat> Absalom was handsome. He was amongst the most fine men in all of Israel. In fact, he was the most handsome man in all of Israel. So in the midst of all of this, all of a sudden we have this paragraph about how good looking he is and how vain he is. In fact, it really is kind of an interesting thing because the scripture tells us that no one else in all of Israel was so highly praised for his appearance and that from head to toe he had not a single blemish on him. Oh, right? So cute. You just almost want to reach out and pinch his cheek or something. I don't know. But not only that, that he only cut his hair once a year because once a year his hair would become too heavy. And not only did he cut his hair once a year, he would weigh it, and it weighed 200 shekels. And by the way, in case you were worried that that was just sort of a guesstimate, it says by the royal standard in the scripture. So how does hair weigh 200 shekels when it's a year's worth of growth? Well, for one, they put a lot of oil in their hair, especially right before they cut it, so it has a lot of oil in it. And if you are wealthy, you might sprinkle a little gold dust in there as well, just to make sure that everything looks good. I, I think that's what you would do instead, you know, I, I've heard, I don't know, but I've heard some ladies and some men kind of color their hair to make some, anyway, I'm not making any statements that it happens, but perhaps it was something like that. We're also told that he has three sons and a daughter who he has named after his sister, the one that he's been taking care of, and she is described as having grown up into being a beautiful woman. So we have this little history, and part of the point, I believe, is to say that Absalom could be the next in line. He could be a good choice to replace David when the time comes because, look, he's just as good looking, just like David was. And he's got this family, this wonderful family, and some sons that could, could follow him. And he seems to be having a wonderful time. In fact, scholars say that it's possible that Absalom's popularity amongst the people of Israel might be one of the reasons why Joab was in such a hurry to bring him back. That in fact it might have been a goal to go because that's what the people were wanting. You got to make things right so that Absalom can come back. We need the eye candy in the leader. Yeah. Right? David just hangs out at the, at, the, at the palace all day long these days. Right? So that sets us up for today's passage. 2 Samuel chapter 14, verses 28 through 33 say this. Absalom lived for two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. Then Absalom sent for Joab in order to send him to the king, but Joab refused to come to him. So he sent a second time, but he refused to come. Then he said to his servants, Look, Joab's field is next to mine, and he has barley there. Go set it on fire. 
So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab did go to Absalom's house, and he said to him, Why on earth have your servants set my field on fire? Absalom said to Joab, Look, I called you twice. You wouldn't answer. You wouldn't take my calls. You were ghosting me. He said, I sent word to you and said, Come here so I can send you to the king and ask. Why have I come from Gesher? It would have been better for me if you had let me stay there. Now then, I want to see the king's face. And if I'm guilty of anything, let him put me to death. So Joab went to the king and told him this. Then the king summoned Absalom, and he came in and bowed down with his face to the ground before the king. And the king kissed Absalom. Almost an anticlimactic ending after everything I've told you. <laughs> Where do we go from here? A couple things that we figure out about Absalom. He is going to some pretty serious extremes if he is willing to set somebody's field on fire in order to get them to pay attention. That's kind of a... a, a uh, well, obviously not a very nice thing to do. Because the barley would mean money. So he's basically destroying his livelihood. Joab's just done this wonderful favor and brought him back. So what? It's been two years. Why are you now causing issues? But it's kind of interesting from what we may surmise from this. For example, apparently Absalom's not even allowed to leave his house. If Joab's field is right next door and Joab lives near his field, Absalom can't even leave his house to go knock on Joab's door. Let himself into his house, sit in his recliner. He'd come home. Joab will answer. Right? If I really needed to get a hold of you, what would I do? I'd come to your house. I'd knock on the door. I'd peek in the windows. Say, you're ghosting me. I need you to volunteer in the nursery and I'm not going to let it go. Just kidding, I would never do that. Never. You also wonder why Joab isn't just running over to Absalom. If it was so important for Joab to bring Absalom in, and, and it was so important for everything to go, why is it that at this point it's not happening? Go ahead and fast forward me because I've lost my control up here. Absalom, at this point, doesn't think he has any guilt at all for what he's done. None at all. I want you to think for a moment about what has happened here. You have Absalom, who has killed his brother Amnon, and doesn't believe that he's done a single thing wrong, Perhaps because he feels justified because that's what Amnon deserved. So he carried out the sentence which David should have carried out. But since David was not strong enough to do what he should have done in his own family, Absalom took the matters into his own hands and made it occur. Regardless, we know that Absalom doesn't think that there's any good reason for, for David to keep shunning him. It's time for this to be over. Hey, you know he feels that way because basically he says, let me see the face of the king. If he wants me dead, here I am. Let him, let him do his thing. Joab tells the king what Absalom has said. David agrees to see him. Now, Here's what I think most of us are sort of expecting, that finally David's going to kind of get over himself. He's going to be like ready to see his son. And, and yes, you killed one of my boys, but you know, I'd already been told that I'm going to have to basically repay four times. So I've already lost one son to an illness. Now I've lost a son to murder. And, and I guess some of this is what I just simply have to do. So David agrees to see him, and, and then that's the way it is. 
go ahead to the next slide. The language of action, as we read through the rest of the story, is as a servant to the king. Absalom does not approach David like a son approaches a father. He approaches like he's a servant. So you have David basically saying, I'm summoning my son from his place to come to the palace. He gets there. He immediately bows down. These are not the actions of a son. You would say, I miss my son. Go get him for me. And when you see him, he would come in and he would walk in and maybe he'd have his head down, but he wouldn't bow down like just a common servant. That's not what you would do, right? That's not how families greet each other. I would sometimes love for my children to walk into the room and just bow to me and say, oh, wonderful father. (laughs) I've tried to get them to say, oh, benevolent one a time or two, but they won't. They always change it. But this is how things are supposed to be. But when David kisses his son, he doesn't do it as a father to a son. He does it as an act of pardon. It's the king saying, you are forgiven for the act that you did. Now, I'm going to tell you that I think that David is motivated somewhat by his love for Absalom. He might be really upset with Absalom, but I think he does some about love. But this kiss is not one of those loving kisses. This is not the moment in which there's this wonderful family reunion, and they're all holding each other tight, and they won't even let each other go, and they give each other kisses on the cheek, and and they are just so excited to see each other. He's bowing down when David walks over, gives him a kiss, and says, basically, you're pardoned. Now go. That was the end of the chapter. It was the end of the story. And by the way, in our next episode, what you're going to get to see is a full-blown revolt. Okay? David is reaping what his lack of leadership within his own family has sown. When you hear David spoken of as a king through the entire Bible, he's the one that everybody wants back. And they all say, look, we want the king. We want David. We need a king just like David at Christmas time. And we're coming up to Christmas really fast. What is everybody looking for? They're looking for the the Messiah who is the king that is from the line of David because he's going to be like David who's going to come in and take over the government and do things wonderfully. And God sends a baby in a manger, but that's a whole nother story. Right? David was a fantastic king, but his family is a fantastic mess. They put the fun in dysfunctional, right? I mean, we all have dysfunctional families. We can go there, right? But you look at David's family, you're like, wow, this is awesome. We're not that bad. What should have been David's guiding principles as it relates to others' immoral acts? First thing I would tell you is that forgiveness, active forgiveness, should have been a guiding principle as David confronted others' immoral acts. It's clear David doesn't have the stomach to do what he needs to do as king and put his own sons to death or to to whatever as a result of their actions. In fact, we see that in his life. We'll, We'll get to that in a second. But what David needs to be able to do is not sort of merely forgive. Forgiveness comes generally out of our love. Our love not necessarily for the person, but our love for God. If a stranger has wronged you and you have been asked to forgive them, you've been asked to forgive them by God. And you don't forgive them because you think they're such a wonderful person. You forgive them because God has asked you to. That's going to come from love. So David, if he longs for Absalom, he doesn't long for Absalom to put him to death because if he did, he could have at any moment said, Head over to Gesher, grab Absalom, bring him back here. It's time for an execution. 
or I'm going to put him in the dungeon for a while and decide what I'm going to do. I, I, I think he probably had a dungeon. Palaces are supposed to have dungeons, right? Some of you are with me, and some of you are like, man, he's crazy. <laughs> Go to the next slide. <laughs> Return of Absalom also really stands in contrast to a story we all know and love. You know the story of the prodigal son? Dad, I, I want my inheritance now, which is basically saying I wish you were dead already so that I could live off your money. Kind of would be hurtful as a parent, a little bit anyway. So dad does it, he goes off, he, he, he goes out and does his thing, and when his son finds himself with the pigs, and there's all kinds of things in that story, he says, I could at least go be a servant for my dad. So when he shows up, and he is ready to bow down to his father and say, I'm willing to do whatever you need me to do as your servant because I just want to be able to eat and I know you treat your people well. And the dad says, what are you talking about? We're about to have a party. What's lost has been returned. What, I'm just so excited to have you back in my life. David's not. So we end up in this situation where David has this issue. He never seems to confront what's going on. If you remember going all the way to Joab, Joab kills Abner for no reason. David did nothing. Amnon had sex with his half-sister, and David came down heart. No, David did nothing. Absalom killed Amnon, and David's been sitting on his backside for five years before he even sees his son. He's not willing to confront the sin in his own family, and therefore what he's doing is enabling future acts. Because he's not willing to stop and say, listen, this is what you ought to be doing. And I love you so much that I got to tell you, this is not right what you're doing. Or as king, as father, I wish I could just look the other way. But as king, this is what you have to do. You see, justice is the other half of that coin. Justice should have also been one of his guiding principles as he really looked to reconcile with others. You see, when Joab does what Joab does, he begins to create a rift. J uh, David doesn't want him to do that. So he's got to kind of become friends with Joab again. The law being something that's really important, it's a guiding principle for the king. The king is supposed to be the judge who applies it. So why'd you kill Abner? And this is the consequence for doing so. And David does nothing. Just kind of lets it go. It seems almost like David... Um, he kind of gives this weak sort of half forgiveness. Have you ever done that? Yeah, 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 I forgive you. I'm going to talk about it every time you're not around to people who don't know us. I'm going to bring it up every time we see one another. But I forgave you. <laughs> the other part is, Forgiveness. Jesus doesn't say, look, I came just so that I can forgive you. Jesus came. He says, yeah, I'm going to forgive you. But there's something you've got to do as well. You've got to repent. You've got to turn from that sinful behavior. You've got to move on. David doesn't do any of that. You see, forgiveness without repentance is an enabling thing. It allows people to just keep continuing in their sin without any kind of consequence. What are we going to do about such a thing? Because most of us either are in sin ourselves, and I'm going to get to that, or we know people that we probably ought to be saying, you know what? Are you friends with God? Are you reconciled with God? 
I got to say something because if I don't, I feel like I'm just allowing you to get further and further from him. How do you handle forgiveness and justice in your own life? How do you do it? How do you, in your very own life, handle forgiveness and justice when it comes to how people approach you? But not only that, how you approach other people. You see, this is a difficult thing for us to really discuss. It's a really difficult thing for us to be a part of. How you handle your justice and your forgiveness is important. The first thing is, is have you been forgiven? And by the way, I'm talking about by God. I wish I could say, have you been forgiven by everybody you've ever wronged? But most of us would have to be like, where do I start? But if you have been forgiven by God, and by the way, God says he forgives you. That's better news than some of your faces are showing me that it is. God says he forgives you. So if God forgives you, have you told God, I'm sorry for what I have done? That I'm not just going to take your forgiveness, which in a sense is a very cheap forgiveness, but I'm also going to take your forgiveness and I'm going to turn around and I'm going to put it into action in changing and transforming and not doing that thing again. We're all in that point where like, you know what, if you make a mistake once, we're really easy to be like, yeah, no problem. You're forgiven. When the same person does the same thing five times to you, we kind of lose attention, right? We kind of get to the point where we're like, what on earth are you doing? I can't believe you're very sorry for what you're doing when you keep doing the same thing. Right? Jesus loves you. But he doesn't love you just in a cheap way of where he kind of wants to see you. He loves you so much, he died on a cross for you. He offers you forgiveness, and not just a cheap forgiveness where he's going to just pardon you and you're free from a consequence. He offers you a forgiveness that is truly a forgiveness. He's not going around talking about it. He's not up in heaven right now going, hey, listen, Gabriel, you see that one down there? That bonehead for the fourth time has done the same thing. I forgave him, but oh my goodness, do you think he's ever going to learn? Maybe next time it'll leave a mark. (laughs) Jesus expects that we will repent. Honestly repent. I'm not going to do this anymore. Hmm. Where are you at with all of that? You see, the three elements by themselves, really not too special, But you put them together and it transforms who we are. It changes us. I I wish that David could offer Absalom that kind of change, right? He can't, really, in part because of his own inability to, to do the justice part of it. But Jesus offers it to us. So, to where have you returned? I don't know what you would call your homeland or your chief country, but I hope it would be wherever Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit want you to be. Have you returned to them? Could you say with absolute assurance that you have not only been forgiven by God, but that you also have repented, that you have said, I'm sorry for what I've done, and your life has changed completely. You have been forgiven. If you don't have that in your life right right now, you need it. And God says it's really easy. Just ask. Forgiveness is there. God says he forgives you. You just have to ask. God loves you. You need more proof of that? You're not reading your Bible enough. (laughs) 
Have you returned? Have you repented? As we pray, we close out our time together. The altars are open if you have some business to finish with God, and that's fine, or you can do it right where you're sitting, but I'm serious about this. God forgives you. He wants you to return to him. That whole thing that the Tekoite woman, uh, the woman from Tekoa says, that God always devises ways to get the people who have been banished from him back. You might not want to run. He's just going to keep chasing you. And you can't hide from God. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for what you mean to us. And, and Lord, we just thank you for the forgiveness that you offer us. And that isn't a cheap or, or a, a not serious forgiveness. But that is a, a forgiveness of the type that, that it's a forgive and, and there's a new fresh start as though it never happened. Help us to remember and everybody we come contact into contact with. The forgiveness that we should be offering others is very much like the forgiveness you offer us. But help us also to recognize that you, Lord, need to have forgiven us first. We who have already accepted you rest on this fact. But if there's anyone in, in the sound of my voice who has not yet given their lives over to you, who's not said, I'm all in. Lord, thank you for for forgiving me. Lord, I I repent of what I've done against you. May this be the moment in which they make that life change. And anyone who maybe feels like they've been away for a while, may this be the moment where they feel you not just simply give them a kiss of pardon, but an embrace which absolutely shows that they are not just your servant, but your child. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask that you would just absolutely be with each person throughout this week and that you would keep us safe and that we'd be able to gather together and worship you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching this video with me. If you want to see more, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified when we go live or post a new video. We'd also like to invite you to join us in person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information. Thanks for watching.